Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben, and welcome to episode 286 of the podcast. It's August 30th, 2017. My guest today is Dr. Dean Gruner. He is the recently retired CEO of ThetaCare, a health system in Wisconsin that has long been considered a worldwide leader in the practice of lean in healthcare. Um, I've linked to an article about his retirement. If you go to leanblog.org 286, where he says, I've gotten more than I've given. Dean was previously my guest in episodes 119 and 144, and I'm thrilled that he took time out of his retirement to talk with me about his lessons learned as he looks back on how ThetaCare's lean journey has evolved, including some things he would consider to be missteps and challenges that they used as a springboard to work toward getting even better. I will also be releasing a separate episode. Uh, It'll be about 20 minutes long. I'll do this in the coming weeks where Dean talks about their experiences with accountable care organizations. That was the topic in episode 144. So he'll give us an update on how that went. And we'll talk about some other big picture healthcare issues of the day. So if you go to the blog post, there is a full transcript of this discussion. There's a three page PDF summary that you can download and share. I hope you will do that. And if uh, you are new to the podcast, there are 285 old episodes you might be interested in. You can learn about all of those uh, by going to leancast.org. Dean, thank you so much for uh, returning to the podcast, your third time uh, here as our guest. Uh, How are you today? I'm great, and I'm looking forward to this. And first off, you know, I should say, well, I'm happy to hear you're doing great. Happy retirement uh, to you, by the way. How, how long has that been now? <laughs> uh, about six weeks. But who's keeping track? <laughs> well, and I'm sure there were, uh, I, 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 if I'd asked that same question back when you were working, I probably would have gotten uh, the same response. And you know, I'm uh, happy you know, that we have the chance to hear some of your reflections on your tenure as CEO at ThetaCare, uh, your your career and, and lessons learned. So um, thank you again for being willing to do that today. You bet. Happy to share. Dean, let's jump back to you taking over as CEO in April 2008. You know, at that point, um, you know, ThetaCare, I think, was already becoming pretty well known, uh, even globally, for uh, efforts with lean in healthcare uh, when, when John Toussaint was CEO, he was already out and speaking um, you know, in different countries, sharing the Theta Care story. Um, you know, so in that context, um, you know, what was it like, um, you know, taking the reins at, at that point as uh, as CEO? A new role for you, and um, how many years? I'll just ask instead of guessing. <laughs> how many years yeah. into that lean journey? So uh, we started our lean journey in August of two thousand three. So it had been four and a half to five years when I became the CEO. Uh, I can tell you that very quickly in 2008, um, my worries were not about lean, but about the financial meltdown and crisis our country faced and all the economic downturn and upheaval. So uh, uh, that was clearly a lot bigger of my focus in the first couple of years of, of, of being the CEO. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, yeah, tumultuous times. And so, I mean, you know, yeah. just a uh, question. I mean, there, there were, what, what were some of those broader issues? I mean, I think it was the economic concern, concern about the impact on, uh, on Theta Care as a system. What, what were some of the, how did, how did some of that uh, trans, you know, the, the economic catastrophe well, translate to you guys? So the way it manifested itself in our organization is we had for like 20 years or longer consistently had a revenue growth of about 8 to 10% a year. In fact, over 25 years, it averaged, I think, 9.8%. Um, when that hit us, um, 2009, our revenue growth was like 2%. So... We always thought in the 90s and the first decade of the 2000s that it was hard to run a healthcare company 
But when I looked back, I said, we were living in Fat City. You got an eight or ten percent revenue growth every year, and we thought that was hard <laughs> to manage in that world. Yeah. Well, in the past years we've had two or three percent revenue increases. Um, welcome to the world of many other companies. Yeah. You know, so it has caused us to be um, very diligent about our expense management. Uh, we've had to look at some of our financial risks and figure out how to mitigate those, uh, which we think we have. And then we, um, you know, of course, kept continuing our improvement work uh, using a lot of the lean principles and our lean thinking through the years. Yeah, because e even during those times, you know, if, if your focus uh, was on, you know, these you know, big picture uh, strategic questions, there was still uh, a large team of people doing rapid improvement events, evolving um, the theta care approach to lean. I mean, you know, did, did that financial pressure create uh, in some ways more of a motivation for, for why it was important to continue redesigning care, continuously improving? Well, I, I think we had plenty of motivation, but it probably helped create, you know, a little more focus mm -hmm. that we, we, there was some more of an urgency that we really did need to continue to do our improvement work. Yeah. Yeah. And so then how did, you know, uh, how did your, your role, your time in that role evolve then as we moved, uh, you know, into that new normal? Um, but how, what, how did your, I mean, how would you, I think a lot of people listening, myself included, you know, just have the general question of, you know, how a CEO spends their time and did, did you kind of settle into um, a little bit different of a groove and routine after the worst of the financial crisis? Well, um, one of the things that um, I ended up spending more of my time on was on community collaboratives. So on how do we create solutions to problems in our community? Uh, for instance, we have uh, pediatric and mental health issues, uh, adolescent mental health issues are problematic for almost all companies. And uh, in most communities, the people that provide those services uh, lose money. So we were losing money on those services. Uh, there were two other large providers in our community, uh, Children's Hospital of Wisconsin and uh, Affinity, which is part of the Ascension system. And we went through lots of deliberation and it took us about four years, but we finally came up with something that has been very novel. We actually combined all of our adolescent and uh, pediatric mental health services into one organization that's jointly owned by the three health systems. And by doing that, we were absolutely able to do some astounding work. We have uh, doubled, almost doubled our uh, number of, of visits uh, in our community in the last four years. So we virtually doubled the number of visits. We've improved our access. So if somebody has an urgent need for a pediatric psychiatrist, they all get in within a week. They all get in within 48 hours for a counselor. Hmm. And, we've, and we've done this while keeping the financial losses, because this, this, this is, you lose money on this, keeping our financial losses the same or less. So it's a, it's a revolutionary model, uh, to say the least, and we're very proud of that. Um, I also did a lot of work with um, various affiliations of rural uh, hospitals. So our community, we have a, uh, other people might find it funny, but our urban community is like a community of 200, 250,000. Mm -hmm. But we're situated where we're always within four or five miles of a farm. Um, so we have a, a, a large rural community. Uh, we went through a set of uh, conversations and negotiations and have brought on three rural critical access hospitals to join us in the last five years. So the challenge with that is it's all the relationship building, structuring those to make sense. Um, and then once they happen, to then try to uh, integrate them into the existing operations. And for all these communities, uh, they had no background with lean or uh, any of the other things that we did. So 
bringing them and integrating them into the theta care system has been very, very rewarding, but very time consuming too. Yeah, and I, I had um, an opportunity to visit one of the uh, the critical access hospitals um, a couple of years ago. They were um, kind enough to, to host a visit um, as I was working on the third edition uh, of my book, Lean Hospitals. Uh, it was uh, New yeah. London Medical Center. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I remember, um, I, don't, I, gosh, I don't know if he's still there, the, uh, the, the president of that hospital was... Uh, was was very much into lean and um, what they were doing there. And, and one thing that stands out, and you know, I think Theta Care had gotten a lot of really positive attention for uh, reductions in door to balloon time. Yep. And uh, they had stories there at New London about really focusing on hitting that forty five minute um, uh, target, even when somebody arrived to a critical access hospital, and measuring the time from arrival there. To yep. I, I forget which which of the two main hospitals were heart patients transferred to, uh, uh, Appleton to Appleton, yep. and that they were questioning and challenging and you know uh, just get you know back down at the more of the process improvement care level that the old assumption had been helicopters were faster like well helicopters travel faster than an ambulance but they learned when they I think basically did a value stream map that waiting for the helicopter. <laughs> was not a good thing, and that they could actually uh, reduce that overall door to door to other door to balloon time by just getting the patient immediately in a speeding ambulance, which I, I thought was an interesting discovery of theirs. Yeah, they, they, they did learn a lot from that, and it was a lot of fun to watch them. So, New London, that was Bill Schmidt, who's yes. our uh, mm-hmm. chief executive there. He's still there. Um, now, New London is the uh, it came became part of the Theta Care system in 2000, 17 years ago. So they're by far the farthest along. And then these newer locations, we've had to sort of bring them up along. And mm-hmm. and it's not something you can, um, you know, snap your fingers and sure. say, oh, I get it. Uh, you know, it, it takes time and and learning to uh, to join a system. Yeah. Yeah. But um, it sounds like, you know, with Bill's leadership and at New London, it would be hard for someone to say, well, this might work at a 300 bed hospital, but you know, we're, we're too small. You know, people love pointing out how they're different. Um, yeah. And, and, and yeah. I'm guessing with some of those newer small hospitals that there was already some proof of concept or a model line, if you will, to show that, yeah, we don't expect you to change overnight, like you said, but it's possible, right? Yep, exactly. Yep. So in episode 119 of the podcast, the first time uh, we had a chance to talk with you, uh, you the conversation is mostly around um, strategy deployment as a methodology. Yep. And I'm, I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are uh, of how that evolved or you know, was, was that still uh, a helpful uh, methodology over time? What, what happened in uh, those more recent years? So uh, we have learned a lot with strategy deployment. So uh, several years ago, we actually filmed the video and everybody was proud of us. And, and then we um, uh, kept trying to study what really happened. Now, what really happened for us, and it's, it's sort of what I hear from virtually every CEO and everybody in every health system, everybody says they've got too many priorities. They can't possibly get all this work done. Um, and in our system, what we had tried to do for years is we brought different parts of the system together. We probably had a dozen different areas of the, of the organization, rural hospitals, physician group, and so on, who would do every September, they would start their planning for the following year. Well, the system leadership team, our, my executive team, would do the same thing. And we would work, and by November, we would have our top priorities for the following year. Um, all figured out as a system, but at the same time, all the different parts of the organization, the different column divisions or whatever, they would have done similar things. So the conflict then is that is two things. We would expect that they would then, if you're in a New London hospital, you would set aside some of the stuff that you want to do and take the system priorities as your first priority. In fact, there was lots of conflict over that, and that did not happen well. Hmm. Um, and as a result, we had 
a proliferation of more work than could possibly be done. So what we did this past year is we changed the process, and it's it's pretty simple. Um, but if it was easy to figure it out, we would have done it five years earlier. So what we did is we had all the people that did the planning in these various divisions or departments. We brought them all together. There was 30 or 40 people. We started in September to create the system-wide priorities. Mm -hmm. And I challenged the team and said, I want you to get down to three things. Now, to be honest, I didn't believe they were going to get it down to three things. <laughs> sure. But I wanted them to focus. What they did then is as a group of 30 or 40, within six weeks, they agreed on the top priorities. And there were three things. Hmm. Three things. And then each of the leaders or the couple people leading each department like New London went back to create their New London plan that would support the system-wide three priorities. So we've been incredibly more focused this past year than we have previously. So even though we had gotten a lot of recognition for our strategy deployment because everybody could see the cascade and we used sort of a, a triangle for a visual with that, it wasn't as pure or as effective as it might have seemed. Hmm. Yep. And so now we've got we've gotten much more focused. Uh, we've got the three things. We're, we're focused tremendously on access, inpatient quality, and restoring our margin so we can reinvest in the organization. Mm -hmm. So would you say? Am I am I hearing you right that? You know, so I remember even back you know, when that video was made, and I was there with, uh, you know, the production team. That there there was focus around the true north focus areas and metrics, but you're saying there there was there there was less focus around the activity, or just less understanding that limiting the activity really made a difference. So I'm going to say something harsh here, but amongst our team, we believe. We believe that we, at a certain point, started to read too many of our own press clippings. Mm. And we stopped studying what was really going on. What was really going on is that, although we had strategy deployment, we had misused some terminology. So, for instance, True North, that language is really language to describe the ideal state. Mm -hmm. That's my belief how it should be used. We had sort of jerry-rigged True North to use it to describe our annual scoreboard, our performance improvement board, and not use it to describe ideal state. So, for example, would you would agree <clears throat> an ideal state would be something like Paul O'Neill would talk about, zero harm? Zero harm. But there might be a goal for the current fiscal year that's greater than zero. Correct. So, for instance, in the last um, 18 months, we have decreased our employee severe injury rate as measured by our die rate. We've shrunk that by 50 percent. Hmm which is incredible work. Yeah. But it still is, I forgot the raw number, maybe it's 40 people a year having a dart. The ideal state is zero. Right. So true, no true North should be zero. And we sort of mixed and matched the language, which I think confused people. We should have, you know, so that's one of our study and adjust. So True North, mm -hmm. we separate out now. That's our ideal state. So it's, you know, no harm, no injury, no defects, no waiting, and so on and so on. Um, and um, then our scoreboard that we use is how are we doing now versus, you know, versus our target for improvement for, say, 2017. And we use the term scoreboard because people are used to looking at a scoreboard. Right. And, yeah. and imagine that that scoreboard was... Partly an expectation of, you know, we uh, here's how much we expect or hope to accomplish this year. We don't expect people to go from 
the current measure to zero overnight or in six months. Um, and I imagine it was also something that was that tied into uh, you know compensation, um, managerial targets at different levels. Um, some of that does evolve into our gain sharing program for employees and our um, incentive compensation for the management team. Mm -hmm. Um, so some of that is there, but we try to be, we try to have learned our lesson and try to be thoughtful about that. So how do you, how do you lead an organization and not default to management by objective? Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's challenging stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what were the what are the biggest challenges related to that? Um, and, and by MBO or maybe give you know your, your definition, because different listeners might have different definitions of uh, what many would call sort of, you know, an older management style or different management style than lean management. Right? Well, what I would like to think is that uh, when you boil it all down, you want to build off of people's intrinsic internal motivations mm -hmm. and avoid turning their their internal drive to make the world better into some extrinsic measurement system. But that's hard to do. And um, in fact, in my world, I don't believe there's something that I would ever call lean management. Mm because you manage processes and you lead people. So I believe it's about lean leadership. In fact, I don't think it's about lean leadership. I think it's about leadership. Mm. And um, we've had to learn a lot of things along the way that have brought me to that conclusion, but um, they, you know, they took time. There's a, there's a reason why you don't, uh, go to school at age five to kindergarten and graduate from high school in, in, as a six-year-old. <laughs> um, it does take some time. And, uh, of course, uh, we would love to shorten that learning time so we can learn faster and improve more rapidly. But some of it just, I'm afraid, takes more time than you'd like. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> can I ask one, one other question? Uh, there, there's yeah. a, a, a new book out there. Uh, right now called the lean strategy and, and there's debate and discussion on the LEI lean enterprise Institute website about, you know, is lean a stra is lean a strategy or is lean something that's used to accomplish strategy? I mean, I'm curious for, for as deep as, you know, theta care had, uh, you know, gotten with, uh, lean embraced lean. What did, did you ever consider lean to be the strategy or a strategy or how, how did you view it? Um, I wouldn't say either of those. In fact, I'm not familiar with the book. Maybe it's because I'm retired, so I haven't uh, <laughs> picked it up or, or read it or read excerpts of it. Uh -huh. um, maybe what I can comment in on is our personal experience with Lean and what mm -hmm. we think we learned in the last year and a half. Okay. So, um, as you may know, John Poole has been a, a Lean leader. He was our internal uh sensei for what we call the theta care improvement system and right. last december he got a great opportunity or december of 2015 it would be and he got the opportunity to, to uh, work for a larger health system in san diego california which is where he spent 10 years of his life when he's in the navy ah. now why would somebody ever leave Athens, wisconsin in January to go to San Diego, <laughs> California. I mean, you know, so obviously he took that job. So when he took that job, one of the first things we had to decide is, are we just going to replace that job? Are we going to hire somebody for that? And um, we decided that what we would do first is we would do, we would pause and do a study. We'd do a reflection on how we were doing. So uh, what we did is um, we had one of our um, previous OD facilitators came back and uh, first week in January of 16, we got all of our um, senior leaders and vice presidents together. It's about 40 people in a room. And she broke us into, I think it was six or eight teams and gave us an interesting assignment. 
uh, she had every table draw a picture on a flip chart, and their assignment was to draw a picture of what the culture was of Theta Care today. Mm. So, and then after that hour, everybody showed their pictures and reported out. And um, uh, it was a bucket of cold water in our face. Mm. Uh, what they drew was um, a picture of an organization that what had become very hierarchical and required approval from senior leaders to do things. Mm. Um, it had become an organization that was very dependent on facilitators to do improvement work. Mm. And an organization that had become much more inflexible and more rigid than we ever had imagined. Now, all those things are exactly the opposite of what you intend to do Mm -hmm. with Lane. Right. So we looked at ourselves and said, how did this happen? Right. You know, we've been doing this for 12 years. We got everybody who comes here and tells us how great we are. And one of the answers was we hadn't sat down and looked in the mirror really thoughtfully for several years. So this had just happened gradually and maybe it's sort of akin to the boiled frog metaphor. Yeah. We just didn't really think it through. And then when we looked at it further, um, we decided to take this and have manager focus groups. So I challenged the team that I wanted to get through all this in within 60 days. So we had to learn all our lessons, but we couldn't wait forever to make a decision. So our uh, so Kathy Franklin went and met with I think it was 15 different groups of managers, uh, all with about 10 to 15 groups. So like 150 people, same process, have them draw pictures, what it shows. So at the end of this time, we came back together uh, a month later. We had 40 some pictures in the room of what people felt the organization was like. And it just was not pretty. Mm. It was the same thing. Rigid. So what we learned from that is some people had interpreted lean that it was all about creating standard work. You know, I heard stories from people that would open up and tell me what really would happen. Um, my favorite story happened out in New London. So this woman is a, a CT and MRI technician. On a weekend, she's called in to do a scan on a patient. So she comes in, does the scan on the patient. Then her process is that um, she takes the patient back to the emergency room as they come through the emergency room. She then comes back to her area, turns off the scanner, does all the documentation, and leaves. Well, this particular day, she comes in, she does a scan on this patient from the ER, and afterwards, the patient's feeling a lightheaded. So she says, well, I tell you what, why don't you sit here then, and in this room or whatever, and I'll get you some orange juice, and you get your bearings, and I'll do my documentation, turn the equipment off, and then I'll take you back to the emergency room. She, she does things out of sequence. Mm. So she gets done turning the equipment off, and then she forgets the patient. She goes home. Oh. She gets home, and about 20 minutes later, she remembers this. So she frantically calls the emergency room and says, hey, I forgot the patient's room. Well, they go and get the patient. It's a small hospital. For the patient, was no harm, no foul. It took 20 minutes extra, and everything was fine. So the next day, she goes in and she tells this to her supervisor about what happened. And the supervisor, you know, so what would you what would you think you would say if you're the manager to somebody who made this error? What would you tell them? Well, the manager told us that you know what you need to do. You need to sit down and write up standard work for this, so it never happens again. Hmm. Well. You know, there comes to a point where people stop thinking and they started to say standard work is the solution for everything. When in reality, we pay people to think sure. and to learn. So we had gotten away from that. So, you know, we we came back and, and then we decided to, uh, and we thought more deeply and we read some of the stuff from... Uh, Michael Hoseas and Gary Convis and Jeffrey Liker and some of the things that they had written about it. So 
uh, you know, I've got uh, some, I got two favorite quotes that I've got here in front of me. So from Convis and Liker and their Toyota way of the culture, mm-hmm. to, if there's a recipe for Toyota success, it is deep, time-consuming and expensive investment in developing everyone in the organization and truly believing that your employees are your most precious resource. And then Michael Hoseas, the most common mistakes in implementing lean is thinking that lean is a set of tools to be delegated to some lean champions mm-hmm. to implement while leaders go around running the business as usual. Well, you know, I, th- I would say we made some of the mistakes that they referenced there. You know, we developed a group of Theta Care Improvement System facilitators to do the improvement work throughout our organization. And yes, I still was on a rapid improvement at least once a year or more often. But we stopped spending time investing in leadership. Hmm. And we sort of assumed that if you were a TIS facilitator, you were capable of doing anything. So some of the mistakes we made is we undervalued subject matter expertise. And we'd have somebody who was a facilitator for a couple of years and say, well, they're ready to come back and lead a department. Do they know anything about that department? Well, not really. Well, they'll learn because they know how to do improvement work. So we dumped them back in some departments and we really weren't very respectful of them by doing that. Mm. You know, we put them in situations where there was a high failure rate because we undervalued subject matter expertise but if we had thought about it we would have said we need subject matter expertise and we need you know to know lean and we need to know a lot about leadership and how do you lead people forward well i mean it seems like yeah so that's mm -hmm. go ahead well i was just going to say and it's similar you know there's a lot of of ands with lean i mean i remember you know my first job out of college asking you know, a Toyota trained plant manager, you know, our, our quality is bad or our cost is bad. Which do we need to work on first? And he said, basically, well, no, it's it's not or it's and, you know, we're going to yes. work on them together. Um, you know, we talk about standard work. It's it's not standard work or creativity and Kaizen and continuous improvement. There, there's an and there. Um, yeah. And, and, and maybe, you know, uh, you know, a role for facilitators and a role you know, for subject matter experts and, and, and keeping that keeping that all in balance, perhaps. Yep, yep. And, and so what we've done in the last uh, year and a half is we've merged our facilitator group, if you will, our TIS group with our organizational team into one group of a dozen people uh, that we consider organizational excellence. Mm-hmm. So our belief is that the ideal person to help other people with improvement work has a deep understanding of lean and a deep understanding of organizational development and people. Right. So they need to have both. Right. Um, Right. So, you know, about six or seven years ago, John Shook, I think, had a a great um, learning and he drew this balance beam, this balance between people and the social side of change and Mm -hmm. the technical and the process side of change. And I think that was a big jump in learning at that point. But what we've come to believe over the last couple of years is that still is somewhat flawed, that picture. Because really, you don't have people here in a process over there. People are in processes. Right. So it's that integration of people within a process that is what you you need to have. And that's where investing in people, developing them, um, and in my mind, served by leaders, you know, who really respectfully do that, that's where the magic is, I think. So I would say that Lean really sped our improvement journey for a bunch of years, and then probably for a couple years, the feedback is it might have actually slowed our rate of improvement mm. for a couple of years because we were we were learning some difficult lessons. Uh, now that we think we've learned these lessons, we think we're back, you know, accelerating again and and 
uh, and stuff. And I guess that's why they call it learning, you know, and why they call it work. It's it's not like it's easy or anybody would do it, right? No, I mean this this work is is not easy, and you know I, I appreciate the willingness to share, uh, you know, reflections on on those learnings and and adjustments that that were being made. I mean I think that's. Uh, setting a great example to be willing to step to, to take that feedback that you got through those drawings and not be dismissive of it. And, um, you know, to, to start looking at the new current state and, uh, adjusting, uh, from there. So, uh, well, I, I, I think it helps explain in, in retrospect, not again, stand back and reflect on this. It does help explain why there is such a high attrition rate for organizations that start lean. Because you, they just focus on the tools and how to do an X matrix and a rapid improvement and a Kanban and blah, blah, blah. You know, you're, historically, those organizations tend to run out of steam in three to five years. Mm-hmm. And then if they just focus on processes, they tend to flame out too. So. If you think about what Toyota and others do, taking that long view is hard because you're really viewing it then as you're going to focus on people and their learning and on the tools and on the teamwork and on leadership. You're going to do all of that. Right. And that can be a little overwhelming. But I think that's what we've learned. And, and that's why I feel really good about the future for Theta Care, even though um, you know, we had to go through a, a couple of uh, challenges to really help us learn some of these lessons. Yeah. Well, and, you know, if you look back, um, you know, history with Toyota, there are people who have talked about and written about how the, the Toyota Georgetown plant, um, with its couple decades of history now, um, you know, went through phases where, um, you know, they, they sort of discovered and reflected on the idea that they had lost discipline on some uh, you know key practices related to the Toyota production system and, and had to similarly sort of step back and rededicate uh, to some things. Uh, so you know I think that it's you know big complex organizations on um, you know it's difficult to change them and it can be difficult to um, you know maintain diligence around things. Yeah. So what a ha I had last year was reflecting on, uh, the problems that faced Toyota about five or six years ago. If you might remember, they had this uh, um, episode where um, a police officer in California rented a car and uh, ended up with an uncontrolled acceleration, and he and the family were killed, and there was an outrage over this, and they were alleging that it was Toyota's faulty spin- or faulty uh, accelerator problems, and uh, the CEO of Toyota came before Congress and apologized. Mm-hmm. But what what did he say, though, with that apology? He apologized, even though later on NASA would do the investigation and find out there was nothing wrong with the accelerator problem. Mm-hmm. The problem was the police officer rented the car and somebody had put the wrong size floor mat in the car. Right. So that was the problem. But what he said was, we have grown too fast. We've Mm -hmm. got big company disease. Mm -hmm. We have not invested in our people enough. So his, when he did that root cause analysis, he boiled down and said, we need to redouble our efforts on developing and training our people. He didn't say, oh, we've got to do more Kanbans. Right. Or more this or that. It wasn't a reinvestment in the tools or the processes. We're to reinvest in our people. And I thought about that and said, you know, if I had been able to understand that when I heard that on the news five, six years mm-hmm. ago, I would have done things differently. But, you know, hopefully other people can learn from this and not have to go through the quite the same experiences that we did. Yeah. But it will make us better, and it'll make us stronger for having learned these lessons. Right, right. Well, and that's that's why um, you know the phrase I've been using uh, you know that we're all, we're always practicing, 
you know, uh, yeah, you know, lean uh, culture change, whatever phrases we use. It's it's never been implemented any more than somebody could say, you know, oh, I've I've implemented golf. Like, well, no, I mean, somebody's yeah. got to keep practicing and get better, and then you might get worse. And I mean, look at you know, pro golfers that have had to totally. Uh, change their swings at, at different points yep. in their career. Um, yep. n- not because they're terrible, but they thought that's what they needed to uh, to get even better. Yeah. Um, I make that analogy as a non-golfer. I don't know if you plan on spending more time I, playing golf now. I, I play golf, and uh, uh, I've never taken a golf lesson, which is probably a problem. I'm about a probably about a 16 handicap, uh, but I expect I'll play a little bit more golf in retirement, although that's not the only thing I'm going to do, but I'll do a little bit more of that. Yeah, and if you don't mind me asking, I mean, what, what else, do you, do, what, what's in store for you in uh, you know, retirement from Theta Care? But Well, what I'm uh, telling people is I'm not sure what I'm going to be when I grow up yet. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is uh, I've had a series of meetings with my successor, Dr. Andrabi, to introduce him to people, a bunch of meet and greets. Um, we've got those pretty much completed. I'm going to take the next month or two off. I've got a list of about a 10, 12, 15 things on my list. And what I'm going to do then is uh, get to probably October, and I'll start thinking about which of those things I want to do. Mm-hmm. And maybe more people will call me up with ideas. Uh, I'm open to ideas. I'm just not going to make any commitments probably till October until I have time to sort of get away from it all, reflect on what would bring me joy, where I could contribute. And some of that might be with data care. Mm-hmm. Um, so it might be with lean. So it might be with community work in our community. Um, I'll have to figure that out. And But I, I fully expect that I'll probably end up working oh, 20 hours a week or something doing stuff. Uh, I just won't have uh, the 60 hour work weeks and I won't have the responsibility of running the health system. Yeah. And, and like you said, you can find pick and choose things that, that bring you joy and satisfaction and yep. whatever ways. Right. Yep. Um, That's right. So you, you had mentioned, you know, you talk about being optimistic about the future and, uh, Dr. Andrabi being hired. And, you know, I, I don't know the whole history going too far back, but I know John Toussaint, was an internal uh, promotion and selection. Um, same was true for you. And, and John had written, you know, a lot about succession planning and, um, you know, trying to groom people, um, you know, and, and, and Dr. Andrabi was hired from the outside. So I was wondering you know, what, what your comments were, you know, of the balance of, uh, you know, sometimes organizations want fresh perspectives uh, from, from the outside or, you know, uh, what, I'm curious what, what your comments would be on, um, that succession process and your experience there? Well, so um, I had a very formal process with our executive committee who does succession planning for Theta Care. So every year I would give them um, about 15 pages of material, about eight pages was um, sort of my standard work, walk through what, what we were doing. And the people were grooming uh, a couple years before. Um, I announced my retirement uh, was getting closer. We actually went through a process where seven internal candidates went through a, uh, a one-day independent sort of uh, industrial psychologist evaluation, uh, which with that, uh, they developed a, uh, a development plan with a external coach, uh, industrial psychologist, and they worked that for a year. Um, so I think that really developed a lot of people. Uh, I helped develop the uh, process that was used, but once the process kicked off, I was not on the search committee. Hmm. So that was a little strange, but we had some fabulous people on the search committee, including a uh, previous board chair who had been on the board for 10 years, knew us well. And uh, in their judgment, after going through all this, uh, they felt that although we had some very strong internal candidates, that Dr. Andrabi was the best candidate. So, um, you know, I was not one of the insiders in that process, so um, I I certainly can see why they chose him. Um, He comes from the Toledo market, which is probably three times our size. Um, He's got fabulous experience. Um, He's a family physician like me, so what could possibly go wrong, of course? 
but he has run at, you know, residency programs, created a statewide ACO uh, with over 3,000 physicians in it. Um, in the Toledo market, there are, uh, I forgot how many, seven or nine hospitals. There's like eight or nine helicopters. There's all, it's much more complex in our marketplace. So um, you might say, well, why is he interested in coming to join Theta Care? Because he's the CEO of this region of Mercy Health, which is co more complicated than what we have here. And frankly, uh, as he tells the story, he'd been following Theta Care for eight or 10 years. And it was one of a handful of organizations he would consider leaving to join. Hmm. And being here, he's the, the system CEO at the system board before he was the regional CEO with a regional board. Right. So in that respect, it is a bigger responsibility, but in a smaller market. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he uh, he's a very personal guy, very smart guy uh, with great experience. Um, and uh, he uh, is very familiar uh, with lean. He uh, as in Ohio, I've learned they call it Lean Six Sigma. Uh, he's got a son who's a, a black belt, his oldest son. Um, he's seen Lean uh, when done well accelerate organizations and also seen it slow organizations down. So I think he comes in as a huge supporter of improvement and of getting working with people. So I think uh, he will do well, but, you know, right now he's been on the job for whatever it is, month and a half. So he's yeah. just drinking from a fire hose right now and trying to figure out where we go from here. Yeah, well, I'm sure. And I certainly w wish him the best and, and everybody uh, at ThetaCare. I've met a lot of really fantastic people uh, at ThetaCare. You know, my, my different visits and uh, involvement in yeah. different ways is ThetaCare people have traveled and, uh, and shared their story. Um, you know, I, I've always appreciated that willingness to uh, to share with others and, and i think here's another and you know and to be very humble you know at the same time i'm, I'm thinking back to you know one of the uh, theta care facilitators being at a conference and 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 saying you know with, you know with a lot of humility that you know there's some things that we've done well but you, you shouldn't just copy what we did you know learn from it yeah. and, go, and go make it better and uh, that that's that's one thing I've appreciated, and I'm sure a lot of that comes from uh, your leadership and other senior leaders there at Theta Care. So thank you, thank you for well, that. Well, I don't know if I deserve the credit for it, but I'll take it because that's exactly what I'd hope would happen for people in our organization. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this has been uh, a real pleasure. Um, you know, appreciate you sharing your uh, your thoughts and reflections, and and, and really honest. Um, heartfelt reflections. So um, can't thank you enough uh, for, for doing that and continuing um, the, the sharing and um, the, the, the continued practice and the continued learning. Um, any other kind of uh, give me an opportunity, you know, if, if there's any other kind of final thought or reflection that, that you want to share with the listeners, any advice you would want to give them regardless of uh. where they're sitting here? Yeah, the advice I'd give to them is um, something I learned from the uh, uh, chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Mayo Clinic about 25 years ago. His philosophy, he told me about his work, he said was, life is difficult and people are complicated, so be kind to yourself. And what I mean by that is, sometimes I think people look for a magic bullet mm -hmm. and say, oh, lean, that's going to solve my problems. And then they get disillusioned because they find it can help them, but it isn't perfect. Well, that's just the way it is, yeah. you know? So um, be kind to yourself is don't blame yourself too much uh, when things don't go perfect. You know, you just gotta study and adjust. Or as Pascal Dennis would say, he always says one of the phrases is, we will partially succeed. <laughs> I, I believe that's true, we will partially succeed. So. Um, I see more problems across the country when people are too hard on themselves and things don't go perfect. And so I'm saying, you know, that's the way life is. Life is difficult. People are complicated. So let's study it and make it better 
and and keep taking that approach because it's not going to be perfect in our lifetimes. Well, that is a great thought to end on. So thank you for sharing that. It gives me, as always, uh, from, from from your comments here, a lot to think about. So, uh, Dean, thank you. Uh, very much for for joining us on on the podcast. And again, uh, congratulations to you and your retirement and figuring out uh, your your next adventures. Okay, thanks so much, Mark. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.